Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from Space. Out. Space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. Humans are weird. Hachi. That cannot be correct, Spins madly stated firmly. Those were my observations, Tusanda replied with firmly. This makes no sense, Spins madly insisted. It is the most basic genetic tenant. It is not restricted to sentient beings. It applies to every organism, no matter how deaf or simple they are. I am aware, Tutsanda said. He slumped into a loaf as he waited for the officer to finish his ranting. This had become a rather distressing habit of this commanding officer since they had begun interacting with humans. With the majority of his appendages hidden under his greater mass, he began flicking through the data again. After all, he might have been wrong. It was certainly a more productive use of his time than listening to Spins Madley's detail about how mad human behavior was. There were few examples of stimulus, unfortunately. There was the archaic visual representation set in primitive culture, a more advanced visual representation set in a more advanced culture, and, of course, the written version of the oral retelling of an actual scientific finding. Fortunately, there were as many reaction moments as there were humans who had been exposed to the few stimuli. Even more fortunately, every human seemed not only willing, but eager to expose themselves. To thunder had displayed the data several different ways by the time Spins Madly caught on. Will you feel this? Spins Madly demanded. I really don't mean to, Twistanda bluntly stated. Sound this, I'm keenly aware of how strange this data is. Feel me, I didn't want to believe my observations myself at first. But this is how it is, Spins Madly finished with a slump. Now we have two choices here, Twist Under said. We can tighten up over this and stealthily observe the humans for more data, or we can just ask the nearest human. I think Quartal Master Smith is experiencing a time of low responsibility at the moment, Spins madly said after a moment. Let's go then, Twist Under said. They scooted off the table and dropped down to the floor. Quartal Master Smith was indeed experiencing a time of low responsibility. He was stretched out on the floor, rising and falling in a steady rhythm. Twistunder was under the impression that this had something to do with maintaining the core strength, but he wasn't sure. The human noted their entrance with a brief nod and counted to ten and then leapt to a standing position. What's up, little dudes? Quartermaster Smith asked cheerfully. Can I get you some travel pods? We have a question about some data we gathered, Svens madly stated. And you are asking me science-type questions because... Quartermaster Smith said, tilting his head to the side and raising an eyebrow. You were the closest human and we were lazy, Twistunder replied. Sounds legit, Quartermaster Smith said. Ask away. Please do not take offense, Twistunder began. No, Quartermaster Smith arched an eyebrows as he interrupted to bring his massive frame into the chair. This is gonna be good. But why, when watching emotional stimulating entertainment, do humans show more emotional reaction to the suffering of the domestic animal you call dogs than to the suffering of your fellow humans? Twist under asked blandly. Quartermaster Smith's entire body lapsed into an expression of shock, and then tightened into one of thoughtful confusion. We do, he said slowly, don't we? I take it you were not aware of this phenomenon. Spins madly observed with a tired groan. Ah, the human replied, shaking his head. Well, I mean, at least I did, but I never thought about it before. Weird. There is notably a story of a dog you call Hatchy, Twistunder began. He was interrupted by a loud sniffle from the human. Already, the patterned skin was flushed with grief and stress. He was such a good boy, Quartermaster Smith whispered. End of story. Story number two, Transorbital Traffic Accident, written by Dicemonger. 
Captain Krylach dropped into the cockpit, her neck feathers twitching from the adrenaline. That bang had been loud. Loud bangs on spaceships were never good. What the heck was that, she asked her navigator. Just a moment, Scrain replied, his manipulator digits dancing across the keyboard. Five seconds later, he stopped suddenly, his eyes widening. Um, I think we just hit a ground vehicle. A ground vehicle? Krylik asked incredulously. Yes, ma'am, an antique Terran ground vehicle. The records say it's in 2000 Cherry Red Tesla Roadster. How in the hell did a vehicle get into orbit around the sun? Krylik narrowed her eyes. Wait, the records. Scrain ducked his neck nervously. Uh, yes, ma'am, it's, um, it's in the database of heritage satellites. Her console beeped and Scrain's head ducked even lower. The Terran Space Patrol is on line one. They want to speak to you, ma'am. He managed to croak out. Krylik rubbed her eyes. Freaking humans. End of story. Story number three. Sometimes you gotta be the bad guys. Written by Cal Wallace. You want to know why we are the most successful, most sought after, and most hired soldiers in the galaxy? It's not that we come from a Class A death world. It's not that our gravity has made us strong or our environment has made us smart. And it's not how our years of violence and bloodshed have taught us more than our fair share of warfare, made us warriors without equal. It is not that we hit hard, fight harder, love battle or glory in death. It is our sympathy. Our empathy, it is our ability to put ourselves in the place of others, no matter how alien. We fight for justice, and what's right, we protect the weak and bolster the strong. When we joined, in mass, the struggles of the Carathians, fighting against the despotic Dural, we fought and died with them for little recompense. That's how we accept the toughest jobs, the hopeless wars. It's how we die in our thousands for those we call brothers and sisters. How kin directly related or adopted doesn't matter. See, being from a death world has taught us a great many things. When everything is out to get you, the bronze, the predators, your fellow man, the goddamn planet itself, you've got to learn to work together. Safety first, then teamwork, folks. We come from the trees, hunched little hairy folk, barely able to think, afraid of the dark and claws and teeth, and of glowing eyes and snarls of predators that can rip us in half. Tidy-minded ape men, who used fire and stone and reshaped the world, tamed our predators, working together to force our environment to work for us. Some of our scientists and anthropologists and historians believe our intelligence was furthered not by just the changes we faced, but the social interactions that became key for our survival. We're all seeing the vids, the images of humans fighting against the odds, against logic, to save a fallen comrade, to cling to a shred of hope that they can save them, to push through under deadly fire, or to wade into danger single-handedly, to get those who we love, who need us. Sometimes we can't, we fail, when we get there it's too late. But we keep trying, we keep trying because, and we hope for the rest of the species of the galaxy will learn, when you give up, when you stop trying, and when you give in and let hopelessness win, then you have doomed yourself. Life becomes empty. You become the darkness, the thing that you set out to stop. When you no longer care, when you're happy to let your friends die, abandon those that depend on you, and lose what makes us us, you become something less than human. And that we cannot abide, for to be human is to be selfless. We are uplifted now, beyond petty squabbles of our forebearers. We uphold virtue. We care. We're empathic and loving, despite our history, despite our status as death waters, despite our reputations as goddamn freaking monster berserkers. So sure, 
We hit hard, we fight harder, we kill, and we're freaking good at it. And the demand for our abilities is not likely to run out anytime soon. We're hard, horrible, ruthless frickers when we need to be. But we're like this because we care. Because it's needed. Because sometimes, sometimes, they have to do bad things. Be the bad guys. Show those who think that they're the baddest motherfuckers around that if you play with fire, you are gonna get burned. That no matter how hard you are, how scary, there is always someone, somewhere, who's a damn sight scarier than you. I am reminded of an old motto my granddad's granddad used to follow when he was a soldier back on earth. Honey swight quai mal ye pense. Evil be to those who evil thinks. Sometimes to be good guys, you gotta be a whole lot of evil to the bad guys. But we can take it. And when there's peace, when we're not needed, well, we've earned the break. We can put up our feet, drink and cheers ourselves for a job well freaking done. When we get there, we can rest. First round's on me, ladies and gentlemen. Do me proud. Transmission 24-2451-AB1-DEC Excerpt from Major General Joseph Goodard's speech to the Joint Operation Staff and Soldiers before the Battle of Quadrant 5, the Emancipation of the Relicidon Slaves. Sol date 24-12-2451 End of story Story number 4 Humans are weird. Here. Yeah. There be dragons, written by Betty Adams. The humans on the base were excited. No one was particularly concerned about this fact, yet. Their planet that they were on was a mild, even by the standards of the undulates, who found a mere two degrees of temperature dripped uncomfortable. The base was well built, but meant to provide comfort and protection to an equal parts. Most importantly, the base commander was a shatter, with half a lifetime of experience dealing with human madness. All factors considered, the inhabitants of the base were interested and watchful. Gerska had not yet determined what the humans were excited about, but the general emotional expressions were smiles and laughter and light steps, so he was hopeful that it was a pleasant surprise. Still, hope was one thing, evidence was another which was why he had sought out the apparent source of the expectation. Friend Helen, Gerska, called out as he skidded up to her, all six of his motile legs working overtime to keep up with the bipedal stride. May I speak with you? Your thing grits, buddy, Helen called out. There was a bright energy in her voice, and Gerska could feel his own spirits lift at the sound. He leapt eagerly into the hand she proffered and perched there as she brought him to her face. What do you want to know? she asked. It has been noted that the humans seem to be expecting something, Gerska pointed out. I would like to know what you are anticipating. Well, Gritz, Helen said, her voice interrupted by a giggle. We weren't sure it was going to work out, so we didn't say anything, but my request for a new pet finally came through. Ah, Gerska was said, bringing his primary manipulators up to his mandibles. A pet is a companion animal, yes? Yep. Helen said brightly, her head nodded eagerly and her brilliant golden head covering bounced entrancingly. We don't dare bring any earth creatures to this world. They would muck up the ecosystem pretty bad, so one of the domestication crews went out to the southern seas and to look for something pet-worthy. Well, they found a nice little warm-blooded lizard thing that fits the criteria, and it needs to be tested out on planet before they go off-world with the space and me. Her voice rose as she skipped a little. Gets to test out the first pet forms. And the creature is arriving. When? Gerska asked cautiously. He knew what humans considered suitable pets. Now? Helen nearly squealed out. The crates are landing now. Gerska realized that Helen's steps had taken them to the transport bay, and indeed, there was a carrier drone approaching with a crate about the half size of an undulate. A low hiss came from the crate as it settled into the reception platform. Upsy, Helen called out as she set Gerska on her shoulder. Gone wait to see my new baby. Gerska watched as she opened the crate and tenderly pulled out a horrifying creature of the abyss. Twin pairs of forward-facing hunter eyes blinked at him. 
at him. It seemed to be ignoring its new master and cooed over it. Its wild, defined, human-like muscles tensed and relaxed under its shimmering, opulescent skin. The scales that covered the skin gave the beast a dark blue coloration that shifted as Helen stroked her hands over it. Isn't it adorable? Helen crooned. Adorable. Groska automatically agreed. The animal flicked a forked tongue out of his mouth and pulled his lips back to reveal dozens of razor-sharp teeth. Adorable. Gerska whispered as he slunk back under Helen's hair. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.